Hi, welcome to our Sunday study for August the 13th, 2023. We're going to be in Philippians, excuse me, chapter 2. If you have your Bible, so you can turn there. Philippians chapter 2. As you open in prayer, I want to pray for uh, Marlena. Uh, she had some treatments on Friday morning to try to alleviate some, uh, alleviate some pain that she's been in for quite a while. And so it's going to take about a two-week process for this to kind of kick in and, and recover from the treatment. So uh, just pray for her as she rests comfortably. And as uh, we pray that this treatment will really alleviate um, some pretty excruciating pain that she's been in for a while. So we want to lift her up. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray for Marlena that you would just, uh, God, have your hand upon her. Let the pain subside. It's been something that she has been dealing with for, uh, Lord, months. And we just pray, God, that you would... Uh, uh, work with these doctors as these treatments have been given that Lord, they would uh, uh, take care of this pain and, and Lord that you would even work beyond the medical treatment to do a miracle uh, by healing her Lord, even today. Bless our study. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. So Philippians chapter two, and uh, this is quite a chapter and we've, we've covered the first 11 verses in detail, we kind of have went through verses 12 and 13 uh, last week towards the end of the message, but we're going to start there today. Um, so just a little bit of a review. The Philippians are a church that Paul has great fond affection for. In fact, he tells us in verse 3 of chapter 1, he thanks God every time he even remembers them and thinks of them. Uh, then in chapter two, he says, therefore, and he went into the idea of, of his trials and arrests being for the furtherance of the gospel, um, that he's hard pressed between these two desires, one to see the Philippians again, and the other two, if he is killed, he can go to heaven. Um, so he starts in chapter two with his real kind of exhortation for the Philippians. And he, he started with this idea that if God has ever done anything for you to fulfill God's joy by being like-minded, that you would esteem others higher than yourselves and look not only on your own interests, but also the interests of others. And then verse five tells us to, to think like Jesus, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And he then described the cross and one of the more most beautiful uh, um, eloquent ways that, that he who was equal with God made himself of no reputation came in the appearance of man humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And we talked about the, the method of death that Christ chose and the method of coming to earth as a man and how that showed tremendous humility all the way. And, and so what Paul is really telling the Philippian churches is, is to have a mind like Christ is, is to have a mind of humility. Proverbs 18, 12, we talked about last week, says before honor comes humility. And then and God says, knowing that, that therefore, verse 9, that the name of Jesus is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So we have kind of, laid the groundwork for these next four verses. And we're only going to really cover five verses today. Um, and it starts in verse 12 with the word, therefore, again, because Jesus is the name above all names, that he's the only way of salvation. Therefore, as those who know this, as those who trust in him, as those who believe in the scripture. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that he's Lord, believe in your heart is risen from the dead, you'll be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16, 31, Romans 10, 9. Those of us who know him, there's an expectation that we will live differently than those who don't know him. It's just a logical thing. Um, so being Jesus is the name above all names. And being Jesus is the one who every knee will bow to and every tongue will confess. Therefore, he says in verse 12, my beloved, 
as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So uh, it's very important who he's, who he's talking to here. He's talking to a Philippian church that has not only been obedient when he was there, but obedient when he was not there. So it is not a fake church. It's not one putting on airs. It's not that phony uh, spiritual whitewashed walls like the Pharisees were, where God said you looked pretty holy on the outside, but on the inside. This is a church that has a genuine faith. And this genuine faith, Paul says to them, is, is, a, is a blessing. And it, it results in obedience. Jesus Christ was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So now what we want to do in turn is present our bodies a living sacrifice. We want to take up our cross and follow him. Uh, not in order to get salvation. If you look at that verse, it says, work out your own salvation. Uh, so it's not working to get salvation. Uh, we are saved by faith alone. But faith is not alone. There, there is, James says, I'll show you my faith uh, by my works. So there will be a natural um, change in, in our outward of, uh, uh, works in our inner peace and joy, uh, if you're truly a believer, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, and, and, and that comes through the recognition, Romans 3.23, that we've all sinned, uh, the knowledge that the payment for sin is death, in Romans 6.23, and that Jesus paid that price of death, Romans 5.8, and then he rose again. And so those who believe that, those who trust in that, those who know that that's how the, the story goes, mankind is full of sin. Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice for sin, and those who believe in him will never perish. Uh, so if that is what you believe, what you know to be true, then obviously your life is going to look different. And so when he says, work out your own salvation, it's a salvation you already have. And so you're working. Remember, there's, there's the justification of Scripture in which we have been forgiven of our sins, just as if I'd never sinned. There's the glorification that's coming in which we will have a new body and we will be in a place where in heaven with Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord, uh, with no flesh, no sin, no death. But in between, there is a, a process of, of sanctification in which we are growing in our faith uh, through Bible study, through prayer, through fellowship, uh, through the working of God. Look at verse 13. It says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Um, so it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So now that you're a Christian, Christ lives in you, and you are now working on a different life purpose. Your purpose is not self-centered. Your purpose is esteeming others, and in this verse 13, to please God, to work for his good pleasure. So what is this work that he's talking about? Again, it's not a work to be saved, for by grace he is saved through faith, not of works, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So what is the work? And, and, and John 6, 28 lays it out very clearly. And it says, he said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? So Jesus is talking to the 5,000. He's fed them. And now they want to force him to be their king. Jesus retreats from them and they find him. They follow him and and. Uh, he explains to them in John chapter 6 that their motivation is wrong. They simply want these physical things from their king. Um, and so they turn to him and say, okay, well, what can we do that we can do the works of God? In other words, we want to be able to turn, you know, uh, three fish into enough to feed 5,000. How do we do that? And here's what Jesus says, John 6, 29. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. So if you want to do the work of God, he says, this is what you need to do, that you believe on him who sent 
whom he sent. Do you believe in him whom he sent? So the work of God is to believe in Jesus. That's the work. That is the working out your own salvation. It is this idea, we're going to be talking about this in 1 Corinthians 13, in which Paul uh, tells Corinthians to examine themselves uh, to see if Christ is really dwells within them. Uh, Galatians 2.20, it's not that I live, but Christ lives in me, Paul says. So uh, that's my personal um, confirmation of my salvation. It's not what I do on the outside, because sometimes the outside doesn't act any different than I did when I wasn't saved. I still have a tendency to, to have the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. I have those fleshly things. Paul says in Romans 7, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. So there, there is that struggle between those two natures, so to speak. However, there was no existence of God in my life before 1979. Since 1979, since the moment uh, Christ has been uh, in the center, uh, I'm different. I'm changed. There's, there's some negative things about me that are still true, but I, I desire to please God. I don't often enough do it, but it is my desire. And so I know there's, there's no doubt. I know what changed in me and people can accuse me of being fake or on the outside or motive, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter because I know what happened inside of me uh, the day I became a Christian. And that's not changed, and it's been 40 years or, or more. Um, so this idea that working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, well, that, that just simply means take your Christian walk seriously, Philippians, knowing that we're all going to stand before God someday. Find yourself working uh, to please him. Uh, the parables that Jesus gave the, about the kingdom of heaven so many times was the master coming home to find those faithful to him who are working, those with the oil in their lamps. And, and so we want to be found working because it's not us who do the work. Verse 13, again, it is Christ who works in you. And, and that's the reason. Because of the name of Jesus, which is above every name, that obviously, logically, our lives as those who have been saved and born again should live to please the one who created us. It's something about that name. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's just one name, Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God. And there's one mediator between man, God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only name where why we can be saved. That's why when I pray, when I end my prayer, I pray in Jesus' name, because I'm not even allowed to, to access God unless I come in the name of Jesus. Uh, the name is above all names. Romans 10, 9, we read that earlier, but let me uh, or give you some more. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 11 says, No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Wise man builds his house upon the rock, and that rock is Christ. It's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. There's no other name. So why wouldn't we live to please this Jesus? That's what it means to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, uh, take this salvation and rejoice in it. Praise God for it. And then present that body a living sacrifice for him. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. It's the name of Jesus. Whoever calls upon the name of Jesus 
will be saying. Uh, you know, we have a lot of debates and talks about what you have to say that, you know, you shouldn't ask Jesus to come into your heart or you shouldn't ask Jesus to do this or you better say this. It is not what you say, it's what you believe. And if you believe that Jesus is Lord and that he's risen from the dead and you call upon him and say, God, Lord, save me, I'm a sinner. Oh, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So this work of our salvation, this, this process of service to God is only uh, a logical choice. Why would you not serve your creator? Why would you not serve the one who gave you salvation in the first place, the one who dwells within you, the one who welcomed you home? It's logic to serve him. We are saved by faith alone. But faith is not alone. It, 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 that faith then, James says it, I'll show you my faith by my works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we quote it all the time. By grace have you been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So Ephesians 2, 9 says, it's not of works. And then verse 10 says, and we are his workmanship, created for good works. Well, how do they fit together? Well, it's simple. Don't complicate it. We are not saved through works. We are saved by grace through faith. But a true, born-again, saved Christian will not be the same. And if they truly understand the, the breadth and the height and the depth of the love of Christ, as Paul just explained to them, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that he humbled himself, became a form of a man, became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, why would you not? serve the name above all names. So he says to the Philippians, look, my brethren, as you have obeyed in the past, just keep going. Work out that salvation. Take that salvation and work with it. Let God work through you in it. It is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's what we talked about last week. God says, you know, Fulfill my joy if I've ever consoled you or, or, or comforted you. Oh, man, serve me. That's what it means to work out your own salvation. That You're not done. It's, it's not like, well, God saved me, and then I'm going to go out and keep living like I was living before. No, you, your life will change, and you will be compelled by love, Paul says, to preach the gospel and serve the Lord. So then verse 14 he starts to kind of give some, some examples of what will be different. Because these works are, are, are not always um, um, tangible. Uh, I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to go preach. I'm going to go do. They are characteristics that are within you. Look at verse 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And so we see these works are a change in your nature, being conformed to be transformed, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. And we begin to be changed through the fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.22 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, we should walk in the Spirit. So this is what changes. It's not like, you know, I'm a plumber, I become a Christian. And now I go off and become a missionary to Brazil. No, it is I'm a plumber. I'm a little bit 
overwhelmed and I'm a little bit down and I'm a little bit guilty and I'm a little bit ashamed and I become a Christian and I have within my heart now a plumber that now has love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, makes me a, a better electrician or plumber or teacher, police officer, fireman, whatever God's work for you to do, your countenance, your spirit changes. You are a new creature. And so it looks different and you become blameless and harmless children of God. We're not murmuring, not complaining, not uh, disputing with God. Uh, you accept, you surrender that life to Christ. Uh, Ephesians 4.30 it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit to whom you were sealed in the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. You have this realization of the complete forgiveness of Christ, the grace and mercy of Jesus. And you begin to look at the world, uh, not uh, no man according to the flesh. And you begin to see people the way Jesus did on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And James 127, I really like this verse. It says, pure and undefiled religion before God. God actually defines religion in the Bible. He says it's this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So it's a twofold pure religion. It is esteeming others higher than yourself, meeting the needs of those who have a need, and staying unspotted from the sin and immorality. So, so when you look at these verses, uh, uh, what will change in you, the works will be works of joy and peace and service. You won't do things with murmuring or complaining. It doesn't mean if there's a need, and that, that's kind of a, a, you know, for example, if, if we have church on a Sunday morning, it's 110 degrees outside. We always have some of those days. We have fans and an air conditioner, but we forget to turn them on. And everybody's in here just sweating up a storm and, and super uncomfortable. And someone says, Pastor, can we turn the air conditioner on? And I say, well, you know what? You're murmuring and complaining. No, they're not murmuring and complaining. There are needs that, that need to be voiced, but not in a way of... of dissension and argumentative and uh and, and there's just a change in attitude there's a change in your inside which is visible on the outside they are no, they will know we are christians by our love and that's kind of working that out uh, romans 12 verse 9 puts it this way let love be without hypocrisy don't be it's not a fake thing you're different abhor what is evil cling to what is good. There, there is a, uh, we, we struggle with sin, but there are things I just despise that I used to think were okay. Uh, and we want to cling to what is good. Be kind and affectionate one to another with brotherly love, Romans 12, 10. And honor, giving preference to one another. There's that same principle of esteeming others higher than themselves. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, knowing Jesus is coming back. Patient in tribulation, things aren't going to be perfect. Continuing steadfastly in prayer and distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. So that there is a, again, a list. We have, we've read a few of those verses. And if you take those lists, they're not all that complicated because they're all parallel and equal with the fruit of the Spirit. There'll be a love and a joy and a kindness and a peace and a self control. You won't be perfect. You're going to have those days as Paul did where he, you know, um, things I don't want to do, I do. I want to be a kind, unselfish, unspotted from the world, servant of the Lord. It's what I want to do. I really do. I, I, I'm, I'm honest as could be. It's really what I want. Problem is my flesh is, is, filled with with you know my first 20 years of life not even in being a christian and, and uh, there's filth all over the world and there's filth in my flesh so i'm not perfect but i'm striving 
to be more like Christ. I'm striving to know him better. I'm striving to not quench the Holy Spirit. And because that verse is in there, um, but I will tell you this, before I was a Christian, I didn't have any desire to do those things. It was all about self, all about fulfilling the lusts of my uh, pride and flesh and eyes and those things. Uh, so there's a difference. So when he says to work out your own salvation, it's not to work to be saved. It is to work on the uh, purpose and the uh, the service of your salvation to the one who saved you. He's left us here for a reason, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to be lights in a crooked and perverse generation. That's what it says in that verse. We live in a world that is twisted and turned. And when you think of those thought process, and this is really where it gets um, complicated to the world. So God wants you to be uh, children of God in a, the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So in other words, uh, the, the best way to go is a straight line. And the best way to go is stay on that narrow path of Christ. So here's the problem. The word perverse means uh, out of joint, uh, out of character, out of uh, common sense. Uh, crooked means off the, the proper road. But in order to have something perverse and crooked, you have to have something that's already established as being straight and normal. So who gets to decide that? Uh, you know, we're, we're in this country, we are uh, fighting against certain things of abortion, child trafficking, some real evil things in the world today that, that the Bible says in the end days, what's called evil will be called good. What's good will be called evil. So is abortion perverse? Well, if you know that, that every life is created by God, and he knows us before we're in our mother's womb, uh, Jeremiah 1.5 and others, uh, then that becomes a perverse act to willingly take the life of, of a child that God has created. But if, if, if there is no God and the baby's not out of the womb yet, you may think it's perfectly normal to take that life. So what is the determining factor? And it has to be, again, the rock, the foundation, the name above all names. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. So what Jesus says is right and normal and straight, that's what is right and normal and straight. And so as a Christian, we want to live right and normal according to God in a world that is getting more crooked and more perverse and more away from the things that God says are right. Lastly, in this working out your own salvation, it is basically a, 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 an enhance of the Holy Spirit in your life, a change in your nature and your character. And the other thing that will happen is verse 16, holding fast to the word of life. So what's the word of life? So that I may rejoice in the day of Christ and have not run in vain or labored in vain. So not only are we different on the inside, a new creature living for others more than ourselves, being kind to one another, uh, clinging to what is good, abhorring what is evil, but also there will be a love for the word of life. And the word of life is, is the word of God, but it's more than that. In fact, John 1.1 1, 1 says that this word is Jesus. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1 14 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father. So there's no doubt John 1 1 is referring to Jesus Christ. So we hold fast and, and, and cling to what is good. And there's Jesus is all that's good. And so we hang on to the word. In fact, that word hold fast it, 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 you can actually translate it in some to hold forth. It's actually to present the word, to cling to it as truth, and then hold it out so other people can know it and see it. Uh, so we've got to cling 
to the word. The word becomes that foundation because it's Christ. Christ is the foundation. We've got to hear it. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to study it. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show thyself approved in the God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we need to study it. We need to meditate on it. God told Joshua in Joshua 1, 8 to meditate on his word day and night and to observe everything written in it. And then you'll have uh, make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but he delights in the law of God's word and, and the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. And he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in its season, and whatever he doeth shall prosper. So we meditate. Think about what God is saying. Meditate is the same Word is a cow that chews its cud. So we, we just kind of regurgitate and think about what God is saying and, and rightly divide it, study it. Look up a word in the dictionary if you don't understand it. Get the, the just of who he's talking to, to meditate. So hear the word of God. Accept it as being the truth. John 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And share it. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering, teaching. So we want to uh, recognize that this word is Jesus. And so when we have the, the Bible in our hand, we have the very words of God written uh, as the spirit moved holy men of God to write what all is, is inspired by God, all scripture profitable for reproof and correction, instruction and in righteousness. And so we recognize the Bible as being the word of God, and we recognize the word being Jesus. And so we hear it, we study it, we meditate on it, and we share it. That's what changes in your life. This salvation you're working through is this salvation makes you a new creature. And you don't always know what to do with it right away. You think different. You act different. You feel different. But you're not quite sure. So you cling to the word. And you stay close and walk in the spirit. You become a person of love and joy and peace. A light in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation. Always being ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. So that work is something Paul says, you need to work this out for yourself. And that's your decision today. What will you do with this great salvation? First of all, if you don't have salvation, these verses, if you go back, he says, verse 12, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, if you've not obeyed the gospel and, and accepted, received, or trusted, whatever word you want to use, Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Uh, then these verses, you're not different. You're going to be the same. And you're going to see a lack of love, joy, and peace, and gentleness, and kindness, and those things. But if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then you know there's something going on. Your Christ lives in you. And you got to work on that with fear and trembling. you got to take it seriously that there's a, a responsibility, not for your salvation, but for service to the one who, who did this. And, and I like John 7, verse 16. It says this, uh, Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but him who sent me. So this is from God himself. Verse 17 of John 7, very important verse. If anyone wills to do his will, in other words, if anybody truly wants to do what God says, he will know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they were in a debate with somebody, and they were really debating the Bible, whether it was true or God's word or not. And, and that's the difference. The, the difference is if you truly want to please God, then God makes a promise that you'll know whether the scripture is from him or not. Um, I am not one that I would hold high as a prime example of the Christian walk. But I am a man who wills to do the will of God. I so desperately 
would love him to be pleased with me. And I would love him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, when I stand before him. Uh, and, and I believe that desire to please him, and it's something I've always had in me, whether it's a desire to please my parents or, or whoever it is, those in authority, uh, my coaches, my teachers. I always wanted to be that. I always wanted them to be proud of me. I always wanted to hear that. And I, I, I desperately want God uh, to forgive me and, and love me unconditionally. And I know that he does. So I will to do his will. Uh, verse 18 of John 7 says, He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So we could put this whole sermon into one little phrase, do you will to do his will? Do you want to please him? As it says at the end of verse 13, uh, do you want to do his good pleasure? And my response to your answer, whatever it might be, is why would you not want to? So let's live to please the one who created you, died for you, forgave you, redeemed you, sustains you, and will one day welcome you into glory. Until he returns or calls us home, live for him and him alone. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Help us to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will talk to you soon.